Welcome to Open Source Summit and Embedded Linux Conference Europe 2020. My name is Jim Zemlin. I'm the Executive Director of the Linux Foundation, and I'm coming to you from Napa, California. While I wish we were greeting you all in person this week, we're still grateful to have all of you joining us virtually from around the globe. And we have a great event planned for you this week, beginning with an amazing 200 plus conference sessions. I wanna give a big thank you to our program chairs and committee members this year for curating our program. I'd also like to thank all of our sponsors for making this event possible with a special special shout out to Diamond Sponsor, IBM, and Platinum, Platinum Sponsor, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. You know, today uh, I decided that I, instead of giving a keynote on open source trends and so forth, I'd give everybody an update on what's going on at the Linux Foundation and what's important to us and what we think is important for people to keep in mind during an incredibly difficult time. You know, 2020 has been uh, a really difficult year for all of us. The pandemic here in Napa, California, just a, a few minutes from where I'm sitting, devastating wildfires, a, a result of climate change, have really impacted the area in a, a horrible way. The entire West Coast of the United States suffered for weeks from uh, wildfire smoke and difficulties caused from that. In the United States, we're seeing social unrest. It's just been an incredibly painful and difficult year. But in that year, I'm proud that the Linux Foundation and the open source community more broadly have steeled themselves and have really done an amazing job continuing the great work that we all do and helping where we can in the pandemic. You know, the Linux Foundation has been up to a lot this year. We host over 400 industry defining projects across all major industry sectors. These are the most impactful software development efforts in the history of technology. If you think about it, the Linux kernel runs the vast majority of the world's computing systems. Our Yocto project is the de facto standard for embedded systems and custom Linux distributions. Our Cloud Native Computing Foundation is the epicenter of a transformation towards a cloud native development modality for modern applications. Our networking project is a project where the source code is used to run the vast majority of the world's telecommunication systems. Our Academy Software Foundation, a partnership with the Motion Picture Academy, is one of the main tools that's used to create the incredible digital effects that you see in Hollywood films like the Avengers or Star Wars or many, many more. Our automotive grade Linux initiative is used in millions of production automobiles to change the automotive experience into a digital one as you go back and forth in your automobile. And I can keep going. We have many, many more. These projects are the results of a massive development effort. Even though the Linux Foundation only has a couple of hundred employees, we have over 250,000 developers from 18,000 companies who participate in our projects. On an average day at the Linux Foundation's family of projects, over 2 million lines of code are added, over 1.6 million lines of code are deleted, and over 3.6 million lines of code are modified. That is every single day. It is an amazing feat. And it takes a lot more than just committing code to make these projects tick. You have to make sure that the entire production pipeline for building and releasing and distributing the software works effectively, that there's a robust downstream community of organizations and uh, products that consume this code and repackage it and create value from that for themselves. And then take a small portion of that value and reinvest it back in these upstreams. This is a huge endeavor. And these statistics you're seeing right now represent just how big that endeavor can be. 
at the foundation, we kick off a couple hundred thousand builds annually, process hundreds of thousands of Jira tickets and GitHub issues. We manage over 110,000 email groups. What's crazy is I, I looked the other day and we're hosting over 27,000 video meetings annually. We have 188,000 people in our Slack and chat channels and hold over 150 events like this annually with over 44,000 attendees. The intellectual property sharing is also an important aspect of making sure that that virtuous cycle of upstream co-development, working with all of our partners and developers at the Linux Foundation results in downstream products and services that create value that can be reinvested back upstream. Intellectual property is the cornerstone of that. Being able to share what you want to share and keep what you want to keep is critical to enable this sharing. And to that end, the Linux Foundation has a robust team of attorneys and people who manage the process of sharing intellectual property. We manage over 29,000 contribution agreements annually and have processed over 700 trademark registrations around the world. And you don't just need to do intellectual property management, you also need to make sure that people who are working on these projects know how to participate in them and equally importantly, know how to use the source code that results from these projects. And to that end, we have over 1.5 million people who have enrolled in our free training courses. A thousand people a day sign up for training and certification at the foundation. 43,000 people a year enroll in our self-paced online e-learning programs and over 300 people a week take a performance-based certification exam at the Linux Foundation. This year, we've provided over 500 scholarships to give free access to people in need or from diverse backgrounds to that training material. It's been an amazing time to see people embrace virtual learning to find new skills and participate in our communities. Security is the other important thing at the Linux Foundation in terms of making sure these projects are trusted and can result in big market changing outcomes. You know, at the Linux Foundation, we host the Let's Encrypt project that has issued over a billion TLS certificates. It's the world's largest certificate authority, enabling privacy and security across the entire internet. We enabled developers to find over 240,000 vulnerabilities in our projects through toolings that constantly scan these code bases and report vulnerabilities, as well as suggest fixes. Over 11,000 of those bugs have been fixed and over 16,000 fixes have been recommended. And while we have a long way to go in making sure that the code that comes out of our projects is secure, robustly tested, and has a robust application security framework around it, we continue to make strides. We've had over 3,300 projects enroll in our secure coding badging program uh, over the period of a few years. This is going to result in more secure code that helps make us all safer as we consume these amazing open source projects. Now, in addition to just the work that we do to facilitate these incredible developer communities, the Linux Foundation itself has responded to the COVID pandemic. You know, early in the pandemic was just a body blow to our team and to our communities. Events, in person make up such an important part of how we work at the Linux Foundation. And those came to an abrupt halt. Our first priority was to make sure that we keep our communities and staff safe by providing them with a virtual work environment and giving them the health and su uh, support that they need in their daily lives. I'm proud to say that we've kept our entire team together despite the financial impact that the COVID pandemic has had on us here in the United States. And we're very proud of the fact that our team has been able to retrain from areas that were no longer relevant to our business today and uh, provide contributions uh, in other ways.
We've also pivoted in an amazing way to virtual events just like this. Angela Brown and her team have done an amazing job of providing a myriad of platforms from small to large to enable the best virtual experience we can possibly provide. We saw the devastating impact that the COVID pandemic has had on people's careers and immediately expanded our mentoring program to bring more people into our community, pair them with Pete developers who have the know-how and experience to guide and mentor them and enable job opportunities for them as the pandemic continues. We expanded our training scholarships, as I mentioned before, and have seen an amazing uptick in the number of people who are willing to retrain and reskill, which gives us an amazing amount of hope for how people can adjust and how quickly and strong people are during adverse times. Most importantly, one of the things that we decided to do was quietly just start the hard work of using all of the skills that we've learned in facilitating open source to directly impact the COVID pandemic. We did that through our Linux Foundation Public Health Initiative, led by Dan Kahn, who stepped down as the executive director of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation in order to facilitate this incredibly impactful project. To date, we've had two contact tracing applications come into that open source uh, community. And those projects have been used in places like Canada, Ireland, in the state of New York to enable contact tracing in an effective way that has contributed to significant reductions in spread. Next, we looked at some of the difficult social issues in the United States and decided to roll up our sleeves and a racially charged language removal effort across the open source landscape. I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Finally, we've seen the incredible division and isolationism around the world. And as an organization that's committed to global sharing and cooperation, we have consistently made clear statements on the free and open nature of open source amidst the deepening trade conflict around the world. Open source as a freely available public good is not subject to many of these trade regulations and is guaranteed to be here now and in the future for all. And this is something that I think is important to remember in 2020, that open source is by its very nature based on collaboration, not isolation. The type of isolationism brought on by either the pandemic or political winds of change is not something that will last forever because as all of you know, through your participation in open source, it's cooperation that brings us all forward, not isolation. Open source is available to anyone in all Linux Foundation projects. Anybody can participate anytime in any of these projects, everyone has access. Because open source is not a zero sum game. Linux is probably the best example of a multi-billion dollar co-development effort that has resulted in trillions of dollars of economic benefit amongst a wide variety of fierce competitors. It is the existence proof that we can compete and cooperate at the same time. And that's what I wanna leave you all with today if you remember nothing else. The world will come back together, physically, emotionally, and hopefully politically. Open source is built on trust. And we must all seek to nurture and grow that trust to solve the world's most difficult problems. Remember, all of you have participated in communities that prove this, that can be an example to everyone else, that all of us together are smarter, better, and stronger than any one of us. Thank you so much. We have a great event in store for you today. Before we get into this week's event, the Linux Foundation has a few announcements that we'd like to share with all of you. 
The first one is an exciting announcement from the OpenChain project. OpenChain is an industry standard for open source compliant and is now officially an ISO international standard. Becoming an ISO standard is an amazing milestone for the OpenChain project. They're the first project to graduate from the Linux Foundation's Joint Development Foundation PaaS Submitter Program. It's important to understand that because now the Linux Foundation has the capability through the Joint Development Foundation to take an open source repo all the way to a global international standard. I want to thank and congratulate the OpenChain project for being the first of our projects to become an ISO standard, and there will be many more to come. Next, I'd like to congratulate someone who became the millionth Git code committer for the Linux kernel. Ricardo Neri Calderon had the fortunate uh, timing to make the millionth code commit to the Linux kernel. For a project that changes about nine times an hour, his timing was amazing. Congratulations, Ricardo, for becoming the millionth committer. We also oddly and coincidentally hit a milestone in our free edX Linux training course at around the same time, where we now have over a million people who have taken our free intro to Linux course. Congratulations to everyone who's participated in these amazing efforts and on these incredible milestones. Our next announcement involves the communities of ODPI and LFAI. Today, they're announcing that they're coming together under a new Linux Foundation umbrella effort, Linux Foundation AI and Data. This consolidated and focused effort will enable additional collaboration and integration in the space of AI, MA, ML, DL, and Data. Combining efforts in both spaces will bring developers and projects under a single roof, orchestrated by a single technical advisory council and several committees, Trusted AI, BI, and AI, to work together towards building the open source AI data ecosystem uh, and accelerating development and innovation. You know, hosting projects under a single umbrella enables closer collaboration, integration, and interoperability across projects and is a proven recipe for building strong open source ecosystems. At the same time, it will provide unified guidance to end users on tools, interoperability, integration standards, and the future of AI data and analytics as its use continues to grow in every industry. Furthermore, as a member-driven organization, joining forces under LFAI and data will allow for greater efficiency and lower cost for our members across various services we offer to our hosted projects. We're really happy to see these two projects coming together and expect amazing things in the future. As I mentioned before, the Linux Foundation has also begun an effort around racially charged language in our open collection of open source projects and open source projects beyond the Linux Foundation's family. It's important for us to remove this racially charged language. And as a part of that, today we're announcing the new Software Developer Diversity and Inclusion Project. SDDI will explore, evaluate, and promote best practices and research in industry to increase diversity inclusion in software engineering. And according to Stack Overflow's 2020 survey, more than, 60, of six, more than 65,000 developers today 91.7% identify as male, 70% identify as white or of European descent. You know, if you think of those numbers, if you think of that racially charged language, there is a tremendous amount of work to be done to create inclusive environments that can lead to a more diverse community building in the software communities that are a foundation of our digital society. At the Linux Foundation, many of you know that we have a, uh, a biased language training course for our speakers, 
that we promote these efforts constantly, but we need to do more. Research indicates that racially diverse groups make better decisions. They create better outcomes. They're more productive. And gender diverse groups improve attitudes towards women. There are a variety of initial contributors and we invite you to participate. For details, please visit our newsroom at linuxfoundation.org. Finally, I'm also excited to share one of our earliest projects, the Yocto Project. Today, they're celebrating their 10th year anniversary. And the chair of the Yocto Project is here to share a few words about the past, present, and future of the project. Please welcome Andrew Waffa. Thanks, Jim. Welcome, everyone. I'm Andrew Waffa, uh, chairperson of the Yocto Project. So let me take you back to a time when Toy Story 3 was the highest grossing movie. Spain were crowned champions. Football World Cup down South Africa. Serena Williams and Rafael Nadal were crowned singles champions at Wimbledon. And Sebastian Vettel, champion Formula One. Yes, 2010 had many great achievements. One of those achievements was when nine companies came together in Cambridge and launched the Octo Project, one of the Linux Foundation's oldest projects, after the Linux kernel, naturally. This merry band of nine didn't create an embedded distro. They created a set of tools that enable you to create a custom Linux platform. From those humble beginnings, the Octo Project has grown to encompass 25 companies and organizations in a three-tiered structure with discussions on more members joining This year alone has seen four new members join in 2020. Microsoft joining us as Platinum member, Automotive Grade Linux joining us Gold, and Foundry's IO and Subware Fair joining at Silver. Xilinx, longtime member, has upped their involvement in the project and increased to Platinum. Over the last 10 years, We've averaged 40 patches and 105 emails every single day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year. As a project, we don't wish to rest on our laurels. We've done a great job over the last decade and we're going to do more. We want you to join in on that journey, whether you join as a member, contributor or user. Help us shape the next 10 years. Behind technology, there's a community. And at the Octa Project, we firmly believe that we're not just a collection of technologies and companies. At our heart is indeed a community. Our work groups are made up of volunteers from our members. Our governing board help drive and influence the project. And our technical steering committee is elected from the wide contributor base. All the while working closely with Upstream. At the Octa Project, we believe in the power of many being a key enabler for success. The Octa Project's multi-architecture, supporting MIPS, PowerPC, ARM, AMD, Intel. And this enables easy porting of code from one architecture to another, all with a single config line change. We're multi-OS with support for Zen, FreeBSD and Zephyr, in addition to Linux. With multi-config, allowing multiple recipes for a single target to be built. And we're an enabler for crazy ideas. We are very much a toolbox that enables you to think and work outside the normal realms. With a strong core, our technological muscle can prove itself. The Octo Project is used in almost every single segment of life from the home with the likes of set-top boxes from Comcast and TVs from LG, to Mars with the Marco CubeSat. You'll also find us in cars where automotive grade Linux is used. You'll find us in data centers where server management control interfaces are running OpenBMC. We help get data moved around 
powering devices from the likes of Cisco and Juniper, and new networking technologies like Terraform from Facebook. Lastly, we are very much a thing at the heart of Microsoft Azure Sphere platform for IoT. There have been many technological innovations within the Octo project. I'll try and name a few that have happened over the last decade. First, came our layer model. This enables the ability to compartmentalize updates, maintenance, and configurations. Before containers were mainstream, our tooling leveraged sysroots, allowing you to build in isolation with determinism. More recently, we've got hash equivalency. This is a new way of reusing previously built binary artifacts to allow reproducible builds. So thank you. And to learn more, please come by our virtual booth, participate in one of our sessions listed here. And lastly, we've got our very own summit co-located here, running October 29th to 30th. Hope you enjoy the rest of the event. Goodbye. Thank you for joining us, Andrew, and congratulations to everyone involved in the Octo project now and over the years. You should really be proud of the work that you've done and continue to do. It's just amazing stuff. Our next speaker this morning is Vice President of Open Source Engineering at Cloud Native Security Specialist, Aqua Security. She is also chair of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation's Technical Oversight Committee and was co-chair of KubeCon and CloudNativeCon in 2018. Today, she joins us to share practical steps and learnings that could help you unlock the open source potential for your own business. Please welcome Liz Rice. Hi, I'm Liz Rice, and I run the open source engineering team at Aqua Security where we build cloud native security solutions for enterprise. When I joined Aqua nearly four years ago, it was an early stage startup working on proprietary security software with paying customers. But today, open source is a fundamental part of our strategy. I want to share some thoughts on how we got the more commercially oriented folks in the company really bought into this idea of open source and share some of the reasons it's been really good for our business. Now, my guess is that since this is a conference about open source, the vast majority of us are already convinced that open source is a good thing in the world. So today, I want to focus on how it can be a good thing for your business and give you some tools and examples that might help you convince other people, particularly the more commercially oriented folks, about the benefits of open source in your organization. If this conference was happening in real life, at this point, I would ask for a show of hands uh, to find out how many of you work for an organization that sells software. I'm sure there'll be many of you here who work for companies where the main business is something completely different, like banking or selling shoes. But for many of us, many of our employers, Software is the heart of our business. Certainly true that for Aqua, our commercial success is really defined in terms of the revenue we get from selling software. That's what we do for a living. And in an organization that's used to selling software, it can be challenging to get everyone on board with the idea of giving it away. You can easily end up in what I like to call the Apache license conversation, and this is not an approach I recommend. Imagine you work in a company that currently has no open source software, but you have the idea of releasing something open source. You've decided you want to give it a permissive license like Apache 2. You explain the license to your CEO, your CFO, maybe your chief revenue officer, and you end up having a conversation that goes something like this. So anyone can use our software for free. Yes. And that includes our competitors using it for free. Yes, they can. And is there anything stopping our competitors from taking our software and selling it? No, nope, absolutely nothing. 
and at this point, your CEO, your CFO, your CRO is looking at you, wondering what on earth you're talking about. If you want them to come with you on this open source journey, you're going to need to be really well prepared with some arguments for why this is worth doing. So I'm going to share some of the arguments that I've made myself and some of the ways that we've been able to show value from our work in open source. For us, the buyer persona is typically a chief information security officer who maybe hasn't been so close to a command line terminal in a while, but they have a lot of very technical hands-on people reporting to them and influencing them. And for many technical products, the people using it day to day are engineers. They typically don't hold budget themselves, but they may well be in a technical department that does have money to spend. And that's particularly true for security, where businesses generally recognize that being hacked or losing their data would be a potentially expensive situation. Now, those engineers, the people using those tools day to day are people. That may not be a surprise to you, but it's worth bearing in mind. And people like to talk to other people and they like sharing ideas. And engineers often have common problems that they need to solve. And when they find a solution to those problems, they'll want to share it. Just look at how many times people, technical folks, will share information on Reddit or Twitter or Hacker News. So engineers do discuss the solutions that they find for their problems. Many of those engineers are writing software and most are paid a salary to do that. So there's a belief that software has value and that people should be compensated for that time. But nevertheless, engineers usually opt for free solutions. And I think the reason for that is really because they don't have discretion over any budget in most organization. So even if they think a tool has value, it's just a giant pain if they have to pay for something and submit an expense report. As an engineer, it's much easier to use free solutions to your problems. So this is the first point that your commercial folks need to understand. It's much, much harder for engineers to try something out if it's not free. Even a small price tag on your software creates friction. But if it is free and if it is good, you can build up a community of users and potentially even contributors who appreciate your open source solutions. In a company like Aqua, my team that builds the open source tools has a goal to get as many people as possible using those open source tools so that they become part of our community. Now, I've already said those users are engineers and they don't hold budget. So what good is that for a commercial company? For the best part of a decade, we've been hearing that the developer is king. For us in cloud native security, it's, I might say, DevSecOps engineers rather than just developers. But the point is that technical folks may not hold the purse strings, but they do have influence and they influence the buyers for your technical product. So when our sales team meet with the CISO, the fact that their team have already been using Aqua's open source tools is like a warm introduction. The CISO is probably already familiar with the name and perhaps with some of our areas of expertise. So that's the second point to make sure the commercial folks in your organization understand. The sales team can leverage this awareness of your company and what it does. A good salesperson is helping match up a customer with a solution that they need. And I think that as an engineer, it took me a long time to realize that sales doesn't have to be evil. It can and should be a win for everyone involved. The buyer needs the thing that they're buying and they're happy with the value obtained for the price that they paid. And it's only good sales with happy customers 
that result in repeat business and a good reputation for the seller. But sometimes the buyer doesn't know what they need. And that's certainly been really true for Aqua, where we're still in the relatively early days of cloud native adoption. Lots of companies are still learning how they want to use cloud native, and they really haven't figured out yet what their security requirements are. Selling them a commercial product at that point is probably not going to be a good sale. But this is where open source tools can really help. They can plug a specific security gap for a potential customer while they figure out what solutions they really need longer term. And our sales team love this. They love being able to leave a potential customer with a solution to a problem, even if they haven't got a sale today. So this is another really uh, useful point to make if you're trying to get your company on board with open source. Another really effective reason for commercial companies to embrace open source is the multiplier effect of community. I've lost count of the number of times people have told me they've demoed our tools at a meetup or referred to them in a blog post or even a book. This is an example of what I'm told is the world's largest Docker meetup where someone entirely unrelated to our team showed one of our tools to an audience of over 500 people. Nobody wants to hear vendor sales pitches, but engineers do love an open source demo. So if you're struggling to get your company to invest in open source, ask what marketing spend you would need to reach a qualified target audience like this. Add in the credibility and the authenticity of that demonstration being shown by someone entirely independent, and this is priceless, and it's only possible because of open source. No doubt you'll still come back to the question, if we give our software away, what can we sell? For some companies, it will be things like support or training. You could have open core, where some features are only available in the commercial solution. For us, we've taken a slightly different approach that comes down to the problem space we're working in. Security in cloud native is a really broad problem. There are lots of different aspects and different security tooling pieces that you need at different stages of the life cycle. I won't go into that now because this isn't a talk about cloud native security, but the point is that there are plenty of different pieces to this security puzzle. And we've chosen to implement some of the pieces of that puzzle as a set of standalone open source tools. Each of these is a useful thing in its own right. So as a developer, an operator, or a security professional, I might choose to run one of these open source tools to solve a particular problem. Our enterprise solution brings everything together into one place, and it adds enterprise requirements like multi-tenancy, single sign-on, high value threat intelligence feeds and additional capabilities. But it's not really a case of upgrading from open source to the paid version of that tool. It's more that a small subset of our open source users eventually reach a point where they need an integrated, scalable solution. And because they're using open source tools from Aqua, it's natural for them to begin a conversation with us about their broader needs. So when your CFO asks how open source is going to help you achieve your company's financial goals, you can't pretend that open source by itself is going to make you money, but you can show that it can build value for your company. And there are three key points. Contributing to open source makes it more likely that your potential customers have heard of you. So it is a form of marketing. Open source tools can help build familiarity and skills amongst your customers. It's a way of educating them and helping them get to a point where they know what they need and are ready to buy. And open source can help you build a community of cheerleaders who value the open source tools that you're building and are happy to share that knowledge, spreading awareness way beyond the scope of the folks on your payroll. 
there are plenty more benefits of contributing to open source. And these are just the ones that I found resonate really well with folks on the commercial side of the house. To get these benefits, you do have to be honest about your open source contributions. You can't just slap open source on your website, which we have seen a few companies do. You really do have to contribute something that adds value. If you want to discuss these thoughts or any other reasons to embrace open source, or if you have any other questions about our experiences at Aqua embracing open source, I'd be more than happy to hear from you. And you can find out more about our projects in our GitHub organization, Aqua Security. Thank you very much. Thank you, Liz. I'm so happy to introduce our next two speakers this morning. Neithi Ruff is the head of Comcast's Open Source Program Office, where she is responsible for growing open source culture inside of Comcast and engagement with in external communities. Neithi has also been a director at large on the Linux Foundation board for the last three years and currently serves as our board chair. She's joined by Angela Benton, founder and CEO of Streamlytics, a next generation data intelligence ecosystem which helps everyday people and companies ethically access consumer data streams. Prior to her role at Streamlytics, she founded the first accelerator for minorities globally in 2011, NUMI, which was acquired in 2018. Today, Nithya and Angela join us to discuss how open is not just about code, it's about data transparency. Please welcome Angela Benton and Nithya Ruff. Okay, um, thank you so much, Jim. Um, it's a pleasure to be here at the Open Source Summit Europe. And I have the pleasure of interviewing Angela Benton, who's the founder and chief executive officer of Streamalytics, which uses first party media consumption data to bring transparency to what people are streaming on today's most popular streaming services, which help consumers own their data in the process as well. And, and she's amazing. I met her uh, earlier this year. She's a pioneer in diversity in the tech industry. She started NewMe, which has raised over 47 million in venture capital funding for underrepresented and black founders. And prior to that, she started Black Web 2.0. And I, I can't even begin to tell you the number of accolades that uh, Angela has received um, throughout the years for her pioneering work. I'm most interested also in her work on open data. And for us who are so used to open source and open code, open data is really the new frontier and, and so important for us to be conscious of. So let me um, welcome you, Angela, to Open Source Summit Europe. And I look forward to this event every single year. And we just have to pretend we are in Dublin, Ireland, uh, even though you are in the West Coast and I'm on the East Coast. And uh, let's uh, get started. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, I've been looking forward to this since we spoke last time. And, you know, um, I'm really excited just to talk about all of the changes and progress that have been happening in the open source community, but then also with the open data movement as well. And you're doing well, I hope, under very trying circumstances this year. Yeah, I think, you know, I'm doing really, really good, uh, which is a blessing. So I don't have any complaints, despite everything that's happening. That's right. So given the audience being open source developers, Angela, I wanted to get started with open source as our topic. As a CEO of a tech startup, how do you and your team approach open source software and why is it so important to you? Great question. Honestly, um, as a startup, it, it kind of seems like many founders think of open source as what tools that they can use to help build um, their companies versus what open source tools can they produce to help contribute to the community? And that's one of the things that honestly we're trying to do at Streamlytics and something that is really 
um, embedded in our young culture, but something that I think is really important. So, you know, a couple of the things that um, we are doing internally, really, it's around our product, but it's also around, you know, this idea that data really is so important and it's powering what we're doing right now, but it's also, you know, going to power the, the future. However, it's kind of like the wild, wild west. So, <laughs> you know, if, as far as like data standards, you know, first of all, the U.S. doesn't have a federal data privacy law. The EU was way ahead of the game and really leading, you know, um, all of us globally as far as that's concerned. But there's no real data standard for all of these different file formats that we get. So doing a data request is fantastic for a consumer, but not really if you're getting like five different you know, data types and hundreds of data files. And so one of the things that we're doing is we started the universal data interchange format, which is really in its very early stages. But the idea is basically to have uh, file processors that process all of these different data files and standardize them into one um, unified file, which is called a unit file that can now be easily transferred between entities, between individuals, between services. So um, that's at udif.org. And um, again, we're in the super early stages of it. But honestly, we're really just um, interested in connecting with people who um, understand how important data is, but then also want to work on something that um, is innovative that could really impact, um, you know, our society as a whole. Um, the other thing is this idea that your data is not worth anything um, mm -hmm. financially. And so a lot of people are like, oh, yeah, everyone talks about data, but your data is only worth like one or two dollars. And um, there's there's, you know, a lot of data services that are paying one or two dollars for <laughs> for your data. And um, I just don't kind of come from that mindset. You know, I come from the mindset of. Um, your data is way more valuable because trillion dollar companies are using them and they're making a lot of money off of it. So inherently based on that, your data is not worth one or two dollars. Even if we're talking about, you know, the amount of data that these companies have from a scale perspective, I still think, you know, your data is worth way more. And so um, one of the things that we actually do uh, internally is we have an algorithm that prices data. And that's, that's really what kind of makes us uh, a little different. Um, and so our algorithm looks at things like, okay, what is the data source? Um, who, who, what company is this from? And what's their market capitalization? And what's their, their product usage? Um, and also what type of data transactions are currently taking place in the ecosystem? And then we kind of come up with what we call a data point valuation. And that basically now looks at, okay, at the data point level, this file from Amazon, it has, you know, 5,000 data points in it. At the data point level, this is the value of it. So we should pay XYZ for this file. And so that's what we use internally. Um, and we're in the process of uh, trying to open source that as well, because honestly, I feel like we need tools as entrepreneurs and as developers to build on top of. If we really say, you know, and believe that our data is worth more, then we need to kind of be able to take action on that. And so, you know, I'm happy to, to be able to um, release the algorithm to the open source community um, when the time is right. So people can build on top of it and build their own things with it. But it's that we all kind of agree at a foundational level, your data is worth more. I think it's incredibly powerful that as a startup, you're not just consuming content and tools, you're actually starting new standards and open sourcing, you know, things and tools that could be very, very helpful and useful to really transforming this data industry. Absolutely. And it's, it's, it's powerful what you're doing. Um, you're actually putting a price on people's data and we often gave it up for free. Yeah. Uh, to be used by companies, like you said. And, and we also have no control over how they use it or what it looks like, what profile they create of us, which really leads to um, the question about why should people, especially underrepresented people, care about how companies are profiling them or using their data 
and what should developers think about when they're creating new platforms, especially to protect uh, identity of people as well as privacy and uh, to really uh, watch out for uh, algorithms that could kind of mislead people into making, you know, really terrible decisions. Yeah. You know, we are, we're going to all look back on the time that we're in now and realize how transformative it is for how we're going to live our future because, you know, we're really moving to things um, and decisions being made by algorithms. And one of the biggest issues with that is if the builders of that are not coming from diverse places and they're building the algorithms to be myopic, you know what I mean? And so, you know, a great case in point of that is facial recognition software, which, you know, we all know that it doesn't recognize darker skinned people. Um, but it wasn't until, you know, the global protest for Black Lives Matter where, you know, a lot of large tech companies are finally like, oh, no, 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 we're not going to be reselling this to law enforcement when this has been a thing, you know, that's been happening for years and quite frankly, um, should have been addressed way earlier. It shouldn't take global protests, you know, for, for something like that um, to happen. But it really honestly speaks to, um, from a developer perspective, us being courageous and confident enough to speak up um, to leadership at times when we are building things that we don't necessarily believe in and that don't reflect the world that we all want to live in today, you know, and, and honestly, even in the future, because even from a pure statistic standpoint, when you look at the globe, the globe is majority minority right now. And then when you look at um, the growth between now 2020 and 2050, most of that growth is coming from the Black diaspora. And this is, this is from, you know, a study done by the World Bank and IMF. And so that's a very, very scary place to be in when we have algorithms like facial recognition algorithms or, you know, loan, applica loan algorithms that are approving if someone gets a house or if someone is able to buy a car or gets a credit card are making assumptions based on data that, um, is not necessarily accurate and doesn't take into account a diverse data set. Absolutely. And, and I think you're bringing up a really good point that there is a place for culture in tech. Absolutely. And tech should care about culture and technologists should care about culture. Um, you also talk about um, learning how to be more fair and equitable and create more fair and equitable platforms. Um, and I think at New Me, you learned a lot of lessons also about funding and making the world more equitable. Can you share more of the lessons you learned from funding side, from startup side? How can we create a, a more equitable tech culture and a tech world? I learned so much uh, from, from New Me. I mean, um, first of all, anytime you're the first person to start something, it's going to be like really, really hard. And so um, I was excited to see that there were other people in the space of what I was doing with Streamlytics because Numi was very hard. I mean, we were the first accelerator globally, you know, for people of color and we were based in Silicon Valley. And so, you know, there were conversations that I would have on a regular basis with you know, your average tech bro that would be like, now, why do we need an accelerator for, you know, minorities? All of the information that anybody needs um, is online. You just have to Google it. Tech is a meritocracy. There's no place for, you know, culture and technology. And, you know, it was saddening because it's a very basic point, but they would consistently miss that if you don't know what to search for because you come from a different group or a different background, then you don't get access to the information. It doesn't matter if it's on Google or you know on the internet. If you don't know what to search for, and if no one is speaking to you so that you can digest it and say, oh, this is like this, so you need to search for this, um, you just won't have access to the information. And so uh, you know, from that perspective, um, 
it was certainly hard to be in situations like that. Um, but to be honest, it really speaks to the earlier point that I said. So, you know, not just as developers, but honestly, as a human being, like you have to be able to um, stand up for what you believe in, um, even when it's not the popular choice um, for us all to create a world that we want to live in. And, and I did that really on a daily basis <laughs> when I was running New Me. Um, and, you know, from a fundraising perspective, that also meant um, from several different perspectives, working with founders who were terrified to ask for a million dollars. Like people don't, we have to literally work and coach, you know, founders to get comfortable, even saying a million dollars out of their mouth. You know what I mean? Let alone being in a pitch meeting, you know, in person with the VC and thinking, you know, uh, oh my God, are they going to think I'm stupid or if I mispronounce something or, or whatever. And so, you know, there is, there is a place for sure for everyone in tech. Um, the beauty of, of technology is I do remember when the internet industry, you know, very first started, it was super diverse and it was kind of like a place for misfits and people to think creatively and experiment. And we got away from that, to be honest. But I do think there is a chance for, you know, all of us to bring that back, especially if we have our own personal code, you know, of standards that we apply to other people and we make sure that people are being inclusive and we make sure that people are contributing um, to the, the industry, but then also society in, in the way that we feel like it should be. Yeah, absolutely. And we need to speak up and we yeah. need to make sure that people are doing the right thing and opening doors for others. Uh, which you did uh, a great deal when you were uh, doing New Me and continue to. I love uh, what you do in educating uh, people about their right to data, how to ask for the data and how to process it and that they can monetize it and that um, how it's being used by companies and others, you know. Um, so I really appreciate that just want to also share that the Linux Foundation, for example, has been working also to recognize that data has become such an important element. And they've been creating um, both permissive and copyleft licenses for sharing data with computational algorithms and you know, for others. And people can find it at cdla.io on the Linux Foundation's website. So let me see um, if we can go on to talking about a couple of other things. Um, I love what you're doing at Streamalytics. And um, what do uh, the creators of um, art and music benefit from? And how are they being treated in, by these platforms? And uh, how are you helping to make it more equitable for creators of content like that. Yeah. You know, a lot of people, um, well, Issa Rae is actually an investor in uh, our company. And so a lot of people see her involvement and she's a creator. She started out on YouTube uh, and is doing great work with Insecure um, on HBO. Um, but a lot of people see her involvement and are like, oh my God, this is great for creators. And um, we're really not focused on creators, to be honest. We are focused on everyday people who are creating data from them walking from point A to point B um, and helping them actually understand that their data has value, that they can monetize it, but that they can also own it. And so to your earlier point, you know, a part of what we're doing is we make sure that Pe people who sign up for our product on culture.io can sign a data license. They sign a data license that says, hey, anything that you upload to culture, um, this is actually your data. It's not ours and we're licensing it from you. So that that's the first thing. And the reason why this is important and, and kind of to connect it to culture in general um, and, and content um, producers is um, as far as, you know, the Black community is concerned, we do a fantastic job at creating, you know, amazing music, um, amazing works of art in terms of film um, and television. 
um, amazing uh, hashtags on Twitter. Uh, and we make, you know, a lot of stuff trend globally. Um, so the issue there is this community is a powerful community that is really driving popular culture. And it's making a lot of money for a lot of big corporations, but none of that really goes back into that community. And so, you know, the way I'm thinking about it is, well, if we focus on the everyday person and help educate them on the importance of data and that their data is powering all of this stuff, then when we're paying out data, we can actually move some of that wealth that many of these big companies are making and put it directly back into the community. So the connection for us is, you know, there is a connection to content producers and, and you know, the great forms of art um, and creativity that's happening from um, creators and in um, society. But honestly, it really, for us, goes right back to the everyday consumer. That, that makes a lot of sense. So I want to wrap up um, since we're coming close to our 20 minutes, believe it or not. Wow. We, could go, on and on. <laughs> we and could go on and on. Wow. It is incredible. Is there a call to action you have for this audience? Can they get involved in some of the work that you're doing? Yeah. So, um, you know, if folks are interested in um, what we're doing with uh, consumers, you can check out culture.io. That's our first consumer facing application that helps um, communities of color monetize their data. Um, and also helps them get access to their data. And, you know, for from a developer standpoint, we love working with smart people. We are in the early stages. So now is a really great time to go to udif.org or um, opendatamarket.org and put in a request if you're interested in helping us, you know, really build um, what we feel like are the future of um, what we're saying, uh, consumer to business data transactions. Fantastic. That's a great call to action. And thank you so much for being here with us. Um, the open source audience, I know, um, really opened their minds to uh, the possibilities of open data and wish you and Streamalytics the very best. And I'm going to throw it back to Jim. Uh, Jim Zemlin, here we go. Thank you so much for joining us today. What an amazing discussion. Folks, that's the close of keynote sessions today. Please enjoy the rest of your day, whether in breakout sessions, uh, and please enjoy and ask an expert in any of our sessions and any of our experience. And remember to visit the sponsor showcase, meet other attendees via the lounges, meetups, or attendee sections of the platform. We hope you enjoy this week. We've got an amazing lineup for all of you.